Hi, Carolyn, Marnie, and I are really excited to have you on our show today. We love meeting like-minded people like yourself in the health and wellness space who have really dedicated their lives to helping improve others' lives. And we know our listeners are going to love hearing about your new cookbook and just reducing inflammation through the power of food. So let's dive in and just share with your listeners maybe a little bit about how you ended up authoring two cookbooks, including your recent one, um, Meals That Heal, One Pot. And specifically, we'd love for you to share the story about your daughter's journey as well. Yeah. So, you know, what's funny, I'm a dietitian and I've always worked in kind of the more the media world, the culinary nutrition world, writing articles and developing recipes. And um, I knew I would do a, a cookbook or two. My first job was in um, was as a cookbook editor right out of college. So I just it, the process got ingrained in me and it, it somewhat came kind of natural. But if you, um, you know, inflammation six, seven years ago was nowhere on my radar. It wasn't even like a, a consideration, like a, an interest that I had. So you had told me that here I would be in 2023 with two top selling anti-inflammatory cookbooks. I would have said, you have the wrong person. And then I may, just because of my lack of knowledge at that stage, I may have said, it'll never stop. (laughs) (laughs) And yet here I am. So, um, you know, inflammation is such a vague word. And like I said, it wasn't on my radar. And it's really the first time it popped on my radar was when I was asked by Cooking Light Magazine to write a feature story on um, the connection between food and Alzheimer's. And this was right after the Mind Diet had come out and they were finding some real connections between certain foods and possibly reducing your risk of dementia and Alzheimer's and, you know, maybe slowing the progression. And so with any article that I write, I just have to do a deep dive into the research. I have to feel 110% confident that I know what I'm reporting. And, and that also helps you later on if you ever have trolls or people, you know, criticize. <laughs> I know the research, you know. So I did that because brain health was nothing that we learned, that I learned in undergrad. You know, w- that wasn't an area that was covered. That wasn't a, a subject. How will your diet affect your, your brain health? It's that maybe like if you had a stroke and then like you had swallowing difficulties, but that was the extent. So I really got immersed in the Alzheimer's research that was currently out there. And, you know, it, Alzheimer's develops through plaques and tangles that develop in the brain. But one key component is that that is pushing along the progression and that development is underlying chronic inflammation, a lot of which is uh, is from your diet. And so wrote the article, you know, learned a lot of stuff. It was great. I had no idea they were going to submit that for like a big award that year. And next thing I know, that article has won a James Beard Award, Journalism Award. So I wish I could say from there on out it was inflammation. It was not. (laughs) I did (laughs) probably what a lot of us do. I just kept going with my to-do list. Okay, I got this, this, and this due this week. Next, you know, on to the next week. And I was doing, you know, all sorts of work, but in writing articles on all, all different health topics, topics that I saw as, as very different. But, you know, there was, let's say, you know, stuff on heart disease, stuff on type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance. Intermittent fasting was just coming out then. And so uh, there, uh, I was writing several articles on that and what the research suggested you know, autoimmune. So I was writing all these articles that were related for these conditions that I was viewing very differently. So when I finally like actually sat down and took a breath, it was actually on vacation. I remember clearly where I was because it really was like a light bulb moment. I was sitting on the beach and I was kind of thinking about what I'd written that, you know, the previous few months and kind of what I wanted to do next. And it really was like this light bulb moment where I just thought, oh my God, All these different health topics that I've been writing about that have seemed very different, that I've viewed as very different, there's one common thread in all the research that I've pulled for each one, and that is low-grade chronic inflammation. Is maybe it's not the cause, but it is it perpetuates, it fuels, it drives the progression or pushes you closer to the onset of all of these different things. And then I was like, we don't need all these separate diets. Really everyone 
to stay healthy or to manage a chronic disease really needs an anti-inflammatory diet. I'm sure our listeners have heard the word inflammation multiple times because it's such a buzzword these days, but can you define, you know, low grade inflammation versus like acute inflammation? Good inflammation. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So inflammation is a reaction of the immune system and the way it was designed I guess, in the body was actually to be a good thing. It is designed to come in when the body is being attacked by a virus or when the body um, has a splinter and it, you know, fighting off the germs and trying to heal itself. Okay. So you see inflammation. Let's say you get a paper cut on your finger and it's red and it's sore and it hurts. That is inflammation. And that is a good thing. It shows that the immune system is reacting the white blood cells and other compounds are rushing into that paper cut and healing it. Same for if you run a fever, you know, kids always have little 24 hour fevers. Well, that's a good thing. That's a sign the immune system that there is a virus or bacteria in your body that is trying to make your sit, you sick. The immune system is responding, running this fever, you know, getting rid of it. Same for like a swollen ankle. So, and, but the key with that inflammation, the way it was designed is it rushes in, it's intense for just a little bit, and then it goes away once the body is back on the journey to healing and, you know, getting back to its normal self. So that's the way it was designed. So it, it's really what keeps us healthy. It's, you know, we need it for our immune system to work correctly. But as through the years, it's really largely due to our lifestyle. We have, our bodies are now reacting to inflammation, giving an infl inflammatory response to little small things in our lifestyle. So to stress, to components in our diet, to lack of activity, to a lack of sleep, little tiny irritants, it's treating like our bad bacteria, okay? And so what it does is low-grade chronic inflammation is much more subtle. It's not going to be swollen or red or acute or anything like that. But your body becomes irritated by some of those lifestyle things that you're doing that maybe aren't so healthy. And that irritation generates some low-grade chronic inflammation. You don't know it's there, or at least at first. You know, it's very, very subtle. But it's the problem with it is it sticks around. Unlike the good acute inflammation, it doesn't go away on its own. It sticks around. And so then as you come into contact with, you know, as you continue maybe an unhealthy diet and lifestyle, or you come into contact with new things in your lifestyle or in the environment that just kind of irritate the body, that inflammation can grow. I tell people kind of like when you've had like a bad morning and you're, you're over it, you've moved on, but then something happens that afternoon. You're just a little quicker to react. That's kind of how the body is once it has a little inflammation. So it's more likely, you know, it's easier for it to react and that inflammation to build. So the problem, if you go back to what inflammation is, it's a reaction of the immune system. Well, when you've got this low-grade chronic inflammation that is just there and doesn't go away, that is overworking the immune system. That is running it down. That is wearing it out. And what happens is it becomes tired. So it's not properly able to respond to real threats like a real virus or bacteria. But it also becomes dysregulated. And that can lead to hormonal imbalance like you see with metabolic syndrome. Um, it can, you know, it can lead to um, all sorts of the early, you know, signs or threats um, for chronic disease, diseases. That's a great explanation. I love those analogies you gave. And I sometimes to, you just I'm hear the word. Person. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, the other one this reminds me of, Marnie, is, you know, the there's a naturopath doctor that Marnie and I both studied under as integrative health practitioners, and he gives the analogy of the rain barrel. And, you know, people like wake up when they're 40 and they're having these symptoms that you mentioned, whether it's hormonal, thyroid, et cetera. And they're like, oh, I, I turned 40 and now my body's falling apart. But it's like that little bit of water in the rain barrel over time from the moment you're born or even before you're born that really starts to add up. And then that lingering inflammation, like you mentioned, it never went away, all of a sudden becomes 
this major symptom that you're experiencing. Yes. And that's and we, and we so think it hard. happened at that moment, but it really didn't happen at that moment. It's right. been going on for years, decades, maybe. Right. We don't wake up with type two diabetes one day. And usually, you know, if you look back, you can start to put the pieces together. But what is hard is, you know, early low grade chronic inflammation, which I would say every adult has some level of chronic inflammation in their body. And, you know, think of it as on a spectrum and you want to keep it at the lower end of the spectrum. And an example of how you may feel it, let's say you usually live a pretty healthy lifestyle, but then you go on vacation and just way overdo it with food and, you know, maybe alcohol or whatever. And you come back from vacation and you just kind of, you don't feel like yourself. You feel bloated. You don't have the energy. You know, that's, that's a little sign. Okay, inflammation's up a little. You get back to your health habits and you, it goes down and you feel back to yourself. So really the key is catching it early, but that's what's so hard because the signs are so subtle. It can be like new um, food sensitivities, or it can be, you know, like some weight gain that you just can't get rid of. You know, you, you've gained five pounds and you've always been able to lose that in the past, but this just sticks around and nothing really works. Maybe more frequent headaches or new new digestive issues that aren't your usual norm. It doesn't mean that they occur, occur every day or like clockwork, but just, you know, at the end of a month or two, you're like, gosh, this is, you know, this is kind of become a regular part of my week. You know, this didn't used to be. So it's very subtle, you know, new skin irritations, just very, very subtle, you know, uh, lipid values, like your cholesterol values that are slightly off. Those are early signs high blood pressure, even if um, you don't have it all the time, there was just an occasion. Those are a little early signs that stuff is getting slightly off. And, you know, if you can rein it back in then and lower inflammation, then, um, you know, you're going to stay healthier longer. Inflammation is also, and this is where I try to uh, particularly get, get women interested, is also involved in the aging process. So the more you can slow or lower inflammation, the more you're going to slow that aging process, but inside the body, and we don't have any research on the outside of the body, but I'm assuming if it slows it on the inside, it's helping things (laughs) on the outside. (laughs) Absolutely. And I think people, you know, when they hear that they have a health issue of some sort, they don't necessarily think about inflammation because- Mm -hmm you think, okay, I have type two diabetes or I have high blood pressure or whatever it is. It's like, oh, I turned 50 and I now all of a sudden have this. And like Stephanie said, it is something that is developing over time. And so the more that we can tune into our bodies and our needs and, you know, these lifestyle changes or, you know, ways to live in a healthier way so we can live longer and healthier lives. I think, um, I really do think a lot of it is just tuning into what our bodies need and it's, it's actually not that hard. And I know today you're going to talk to us about the diet that you have. I don't want to say developed, but like uh, through all your research, you've kind of come across this diet that you recommend. Yes. Yes. And you know, that's what, that's what's hard in this day and age is really listening to your body and listening to your body for subtle signs, because it's not going to be overt. Like, you know, it's not going to be like you're running this fever and it's clear to see yes or no, you have inflammation, you know, it's going to be more small things like, you know, just if you really thought about it, it's not your norm. It's not your norm. It's outside of what's your norm, whether that's maybe digestive related or headache, you know, whatever it is, it's, Never anything that initially that you would ever go make an appointment for as a doctor, you know, or maybe like three to four months into it, you're like, huh, maybe I should see a doctor about this bloating I've been having, you know? So, so that's the hard part. But if you really at the root of it is just listening to your body and knowing this isn't my norm, what, what's off, you know, so you can get it back on track then. But yeah, so back to that beach moment. And I was just like, oh my goodness, you know, everybody needs an anti-inflammatory diet. And of course the first, my first brain, first place my brain went was I thought, oh my goodness, what if I could get my parents 
following this, you know, slow the aging process. But then I thought to myself and I was like, well, I'm not getting any younger. (laughs) It was probably going to fit me as well. But then I went, my, my thoughts then went to my kids who were eight and 11 at the time. And I thought, oh my goodness, what if I could figure out a way to incorporate some of these anti-inflammatory habits and foods into their life? How might that potentially change their health trajectory? I can't even say the word. How might that change their health in 30 or 40 years? You know, like long-term, big picture. And then I came back to reality and I was like, oh my gosh, how do I do this? I'm overwhelmed sitting here thinking about it. I know how to cook. I know all these tricks in the kitchen, but I am overwhelmed thinking about doing this for my own family. And then it kind of became like, a mission, like I'm going to figure this out and I'm going to make this figured out. So it's so super simple that other people can do it, even if they have picky eaters. And and that's really kind of where my first uh, cookbook came from. Now, in between my first and second, my daughter was actually diagnosed with an autoimmune condition, which um, auto inflammation is key in is a major player. Any little thing disrupts it, you know, lack of sleep can cause a flare up, but, you know, um, diet certainly can, that kind of thing. So it really kind of hit home. I was like, okay, no more just talking about it. You know, like we are, we are living it and she, she's doing great today, but, um, I think I've learned a lot more, um, because of her diagnosis, just understanding inflammation from the aspect of the brain, the nervous system, the immune system and, and that type of thing. Yeah. And I know I've heard you tell this story on other podcasts. And I think, you know, we definitely have a lot of parents out there. And sometimes it's those early warning signs that you that we dismiss or we give them, you know, an Advil or some sort of other over the counter medicine and we want it to go away. And then we go to doctors and, you know, a lot of times not every doctor has the answer. Right. So can you just, you know, without going into the, maybe the the full, full story, give our listeners a little bit of insight as to what you saw And a little bit of that journey and maybe, you know, for parents out there that potentially have, you know, their kids have some of these issues or things that just don't seem normal one day. And I know I've gone through that personally with my daughter. We've talked about it on this podcast that, you know, maybe some hope or some, you know, insight as to what you can do or, you know, some encouragement. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, you know, in hindsight, it's easy to see all the puzzle pieces. Now, like, I, you know, I, two to three years or three to four years out of, from her diagnosis, you see all the puzzle places and pieces and all the factors that led to that onset. But it was she had a slow she had just started middle school um, and she had and during that fall, she had a slow she'd gotten a vaccination in the, at the end of the summer not saying anything good or bad about vaccinations, but she had that. And then she had kind of a slow decline psychologically, very subtle, but just some odd, just not herself, a little more maybe depression. But then, you know, she was in middle school. I didn't know she's my oldest child. I didn't know what to expect. I thought, well, maybe this is just a teenager, you know, like it wasn't, and it wasn't anything that I thought was significant enough. Then in December or into November, she kept saying her leg hurt. Her leg hurt, and she is my high drama child. So you know, I was like, "You're walking around," anyway, you know. So yeah, I, and, but it was cold outside, so she had jeans on or leggings on every day. And finally, maybe two weeks after she'd been saying that, she came down the stairs and she didn't have pants on, and she's like, "Mom, I can barely walk down the stairs." And I saw her legs, and they were splotchy. They were what? And it splotchy, splotchy. Mm-hmm. And she, um, I was like, oh my gosh, we do need to go to the doctor. I'm so sorry I've been ignoring you. But she had shingles, which you don't hear of in kids at all, unless your immune system's slowly breaking down. Like what kind of happens as you get closer to, you know, the onset of an autoimmune disease. This is not my child. You do not go from being fine to this overnight and it would relapse and remit. So she'd be in like total depression for a few days and then she'd be fine. And then a week and a half later, it would almost be like she was manic. 
So, and it was, so it was like, you couldn't, I was like, please give me my, my daughter a diagnosis, but you couldn't because it was relapsing remitting and it was, you never know what, what you were going to get. And I, so I will say the key, I think this is the key with all autoimmune diseases is trusting your gut. And you don't know how many doctors looked at me like I was crazy. And, you know, I think that my final straw was going to the uh, head neurologist at a top children's hospital. And he said, there's nothing wrong with her. You just need to work on your parenting. And I <laughs> oh wow. her up and I said, okay, we are getting in. I found, and there's not much information out there um, about it. Trusting your gut, I think is key with any immune, autoimmune, no matter what it is, or just when you can't get answers or you don't get answers that satisfy your gut or feel right to you keep pushing, keep going. Yes, I agree. That's great advice for everyone out there. It's something we've talked quite a bit about. So I have a question then, you know, once you kind of discovered that she had, you know, autoimmune issues, can you share with us how you took your information on like an anti-inflammatory diet and applied them to your daughter or for that matter, your family or how you've used certain foods to deal with inflammation. And can you specify yeah. what those foods are? Yes. So, you know, initially we're getting under control. I, I tried to clean up her diet. So now again, we're talking about a middle schooler and, you know, who's starting to have access to food that you don't buy, you know, outside of the house. So it was really hard. And then I feel like it's almost even harder being a mom who's a dietitian because it's like you don't want I you know I just I can't think of anything worse as a teenager to have a mom who's a dietitian and so I just try to tread carefully and choose my words carefully one of the first things we did because she was having she was producing antibodies to gluten was we really tried to get rid of gluten we cut out gluten and dairy now let me say we eat dairy now and we probably get more gluten a lot more than we used to. But when your body has inflammation, so when you're in a flare-up with an autoimmune or when your body, you know, anytime you have a chronic condition, whether it's diabetes or high blood pressure, you know, something like that, that's that's a sign that there's some inflammation going on. And so like I mentioned, you know, once your body already has some inflammation, it's likely to react to other things. And it may react to other things that you wouldn't normally react to. I knew because she was, making antibodies for gluten um, that we needed to get rid of the gluten. And so we did that. We also got rid of dairy. Dairy was hard. We weren't perfect with that. Um, I can't live without cheese. And, um, <laughs> and you know, it's hard pizza and that kind of stuff. But um, we did that initially and really, you know, really tried to emphasize the produce. Yeah, you know, but it's hard because you're also dealing with someone who doesn't feel well, you know, and it's, but I really see get rid of the gluten temporary and the dairy temporarily adds good. Now she isn't making antibodies to gluten anymore. We still try to avoid it because it's kind of easy these days anyway. There's so many products and then, you know, you're eating really what you should be eating. Gluten isn't naturally in a lot of those foods, you know? So, um, but we do have dairy now that her inflammation has calmed down so much. And this is what I tell people, particularly about dairy, when they ask about it, you know, it may be you need to get rid of it just for a little while until you calm the overall inflammation down in your body. And then try adding maybe one type of dairy back and seeing if you feel symptoms. If you feel symptoms, then you may want to keep it out of your diet. But if you don't, you know, then, you know, you can try another, you know, type of, of dairy and just see how it does. But once you get it calmed down, you can um, sometimes, it's kind of like food sensitivities. Once you get that inflammation calmed down in your body, sometimes that food that used to bother you doesn't bother you anymore. Yeah. Stephanie and I talk about that a lot with our clients. We both do offer that kind of lab testing. And mm -hmm. I know for myself, I couldn't eat gluten for a long time and it was giving me rashes on my body. Mm -hmm. And now I can eat gluten in small doses and I do just fine with it. And the yeah. dairy, I've kind of figured out my threshold again. Same thing. Yeah. So I do think I do agree with you that as you calm that inflammation down in your body, you can reintroduce these foods and find a way to enjoy them without, you know, maybe going crazy where you're just eating tons and tons of gluten and dairy and your body's going, you know, is having. Yeah. 
a reaction. Yeah. Um, so what foods do you recommend people eat on a weekly basis? Yeah. So, you know, I went through just tons and tons of research and what I didn't like as a parent and as a dietitian is there's so much focus on what you have to get rid of, what you have to cut out, what you can't eat. That is where the primary focus is. And so I dove into the research and I realized Okay, yeah, that can be a key part of it is reducing those, I call them dietary inflamers, you know, whatever those may be in your diet. But another key component is getting more of the good stuff, particularly those foods that are loaded with the nutrients and phytochemicals and compounds that have anti-inflammatory effects. And, you know, most of us probably are getting more of the inflamers than we need. But at the same time, I guarantee you, most people are not getting near enough of the good stuff that they need. So when I was going through all this, you know, tons of research, there were three kind of groups of foods that just rose to the top. I mean, it got to be where I was like, oh, you again, you know, give me a different food, you know, but those three foods are leafy greens, berries, and cruciferous vegetables. Overwhelmingly, that's where the majority of the research is in terms of anti-inflammatory potential, antioxidant potential, and you know, so leafy grains. So that's where I tell people to start when they say, when they come to me, I, you know, they're usually like, okay, what do I need to cut out? And I, so I think sometimes I surprise them. I say, okay, hold on first, let's start with what you need to add. And I tell them to first focus on adding those three, adding a cup of leafy greens a day. And, you know, any kind of leafy green, it can even be like green or red leaf lettuces. Obviously the darker that you get, usually there's more good stuff in it. But just focus on getting a cup of leafy greens in a day. And I tell people, it doesn't have, this doesn't mean you have to sit down to a bowl of salad every day. This can be, you know, putting um, spinach in your eggs. It can be, I like to keep baby spinach on hand because I can use it both like for salad and grain bowls, but I can also stir it into hot dishes. So like a saucy skillet dish or like spaghetti sauce, you can stir the baby spinach in there, you know? It's just looking for little ways to get more of those in. So a cup of leafy greens and then two to three cups of berries a week, fresh or frozen, two to three cups. There is by far, there's the most research on berries and just the anti-inflammatory and antioxidant potential is amazing, particularly when it comes to brain health. And that can be fresh or frozen either way. And then the third one is cruciferous vegetables. You want to get around five servings in a week. I tell people those are, if it stinks, if it's a vegetable and it stinks when it's cooking, it's usually a cruciferous vegetable because (laughs) these are vegetables like broccoli, cauliflower, kale, Brussels sprouts. They contain sulfur compounds in them. Those sulfur compounds are one of the things that are so, make them so powerful from a health standpoint, but they also think a little when you're cooking them. But aim for that. And I tell people to start with those three. Some people start with just one and then go, you know, add in the second. And some people just focus on all three. Do that. And then, then once you've got the, when you establish those as a habit, then let's look at where some of those key inflamers are in your diet and what really might be beneficial to, you know, greatly minimize or get rid of. And what I've found is first, people really like the concept of adding. It's like, what? I can add stuff. You know, you focus on adding. And what that naturally does, adding those three groups of foods in a week, is it naturally kind of cleans up your diet a little. So when you get to the next step where we look at those inflamers, it makes it a little easier. It doesn't feel so restrictive or so diet-like. Well, I think that reminds Mari and I of a concept that we are firm believers in. We talk about all the time um, with clients and on this show is crowding out. So you're just adding in more nutrient rich foods and your body starts to thrive. The inflammation markers do start to reduce, which means you feel better. And then you're more motivated. You like crave those foods over the processed, you know, the ultra processed foods with all the inflammatory oils, et cetera. So yeah, um, we're firm believers in that concept. And it just, it's, you know, no one wants to be told what to do, like what not to do, right? We're all have a little, most of us have a little bit of a rebel inside of us. So if you tell us just eliminate these 10 foods right away, it's like, oh no, you know, or we do it for a little bit and then we realize it's not sustainable. And this way it's your body's own 
communication with you, it starts to communicate by craving more leafy greens and cruciferous vegetables over yeah. time. Or you see how good you start to feel. You feel a little subtle difference. And that's the best motivation. Um, Absolutely. It, it's coming internal versus external. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, you know, thinking a little bit right now, our, a lot of our listeners are busy, you know, maybe they're moms, maybe they're, you know, they're not, but they're just, they could be working outside the home, juggling lots of things, right? As we always do. They want to eat healthy, but they may or may not like to cook and they don't have the time or the interest, mm-hmm. you know, to spend one pl- to two hours in the kitchen. So, you know, one, just, is it truly possible to eat these nourishing whole foods that you mentioned without spending all this time in the kitchen? And can you share your top tips? And, you know, in addition to like, maybe the foods you mentioned, like what other foods should we be, you know, trying to get into our diet on a regular basis? Yes. And I can speak from this very honestly, because I have reached a stage in my life where there's a lot of nights where I do not want to cook dinner. (laughs) I am not unlike other people out there just because I can create recipes and I know what I'm doing in the kitchen doesn't mean I want to get in there that night after working all day and, you know, going in a million different directions. So, you know, it, but at the same time, I'm a foodie. So I really, good food is important to me. I want it to taste good. I want to be excited to eat those leftovers the next day if I have them, you know. So the goal of both my cookbooks was really, okay, how do I minimize the time, streamline this cooking process, yet, you know, really get those nutrition benefits that I want, make it taste good, make it be something my kids will eat, um, but also, you know, be something I want that I'm excited to sit down and eat. And that really was kind of my criteria when I tested a recipe, you know, like, would I, would I be excited to eat this? six o'clock after you know and so that really was kind of my criteria and I'll be the first to say I do not make everything from scratch at all I do not want to um (laughs) I do make some things but um you know luckily we live in our food supply while there's a lot of bad to it we also have some really we're starting to see some really good brands that are very conscious about their ingredients And so I really, I encourage people to rely, I call them minimally processed shortcuts. Um, Yes, they're processed, but so are like broccoli florets that you get that are cut up in a bag. Those are technically processed. They're not all stuff is bad. So, but minimally processed things. And I really encourage people to rely on those because I do. So two examples of that is like, um, there's some good quality bottled salad dress, salad dressings now. Mm-hmm. now. Not all of them, but there are a few brands that are that are that are pretty good. Same for like a marinara sauce. You can find a pretty good quality. But I tell people you used to hear you want to see five or fewer ingredients on the list. Well, not fewer ingredients is better, but it really depends on what those ingredients are. So I tell people look at the ingredient list and Look at it, look at those ingredients and compare it to if you were to make this marinara, this pasta sauce at home from scratch. Are the ingredients that you see on that label um, the same as what you might see in a recipe at home? You know, if I'm cooking it, I want to see maybe organic tomatoes. I want to see onion. I want to see extra virgin olive oil, garlic, basil, um, things like that and not much other stuff. Same goes for salad dressing. Now you want to look at the oil. You can find a few made with extra virgin olive oil, but it's hard to find um, a bunch of those. Um, But even, you know, avocado oil or can be better. And then I want to see the ingredients I would use if I was making a homemade dressing. Vinegar, Dijon mustard, herbs, salt, pepper, garlic, those kind of things. You know, you may even see a touch of sweetener towards the end. If it's at the end, that's okay. Because, you know, if I was at home, I would probably use a touch of honey or something because you balance, you have to balance the flavors um, in, a, in a dressing. So um, the other tip is, you know, if you see an ingredient in an ingredient list and it's not something that you would have in your own pantry, <laughs> you know, it's not it's not a staple item you can go buy or it's not something you would have in your pantry, you know, put it back. 
Um, so that's kind of my, my checklist for finding, for identifying some of those shortcuts um, that are processed, but can save you a ton of time and, you know, really aren't harming your health. They're just saving you time. So the other thing I do is I'm not a fan of meal prep, but I know I need to do a little planning and I knew I need to do a little prep, but, and, you know, I do love looking at those pictures on social media, people doing their meal prep and they've got all these dishes and they're all lined up and so symmetrical and they're so pretty, but I don't want to eat the same thing all week. Um, plus you need some variety in your diet. So, but I do know that there has to be a little prep. So what I started making myself do is uh, call it my 30 minute rule. And it was really for myself. And I was like, okay. Every Sunday or whatever day you do your prep, you just have to spend 30 minutes looking at what you got in the kitchen, thinking about what you might make, maybe finding a recipe or two, just 30 minutes. 30 minutes is doable. It's not take up your afternoon, do that. So you can get a grocery list going. And then I usually try to do my grocery shopping. And then um, if I have time, I prep some, I call them components, ingredient components. I don't prep meals. I prep components. So maybe I'm baking or grilling a bunch of chicken for already for dinner that night. I'll make extra so that I have a protein, cooked protein on hand in the fridge that I can grab at any time. I may go ahead and roast some vegetables. So I just have those in the fridge. I may cook a um, whole grain or cook a spaghetti squash so that I have that on hand in the fridge so that if I get home and I just need, I don't, I don't feel like cooking totally from a recipe. I just need to throw something together and on the table. Then I've got vegetables. I've got a healthy, you know, carbohydrate source. I've got protein in there that I can just throw together to make all kinds of meals or to throw myself together a lunch. So it's kind of, um, I guess, figuring out a way to make it easier to get those whole foods in. But for instance, I made some taco meat this Sunday and I just had it in the fridge. So earlier this week, I put mine over some spaghetti squash that I had and added some avocado and, you know, it was fabulous. I made my son when he got home from practice soft tacos, like in corn tortillas. So we use it all different ways, but having those backups, because we're real good when we stay on plan, like we stay with our, what we planned is kind of meals, but it's in between times or the times when we get stressed, where we tend to go a little rogue from our healthy eating habits. So having ingredient components ready to go to just throw together in a grain bowl or salad or whatever is, is key for me. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I think Stephanie and I both are big proponents of components or we we do call it meal prep, prepping, chopping vegetables, having proteins yeah. ready to go for the week, whatever you want to call it. It is it is having I do think there is some forethought that is involved so that you when you are under stress or whatever, you're making those you know, better choices throughout the week. And um, I, I like your idea of prep components. That's that's a nice way to think about it. Huh. It's less intimidating too on a Sunday afternoon when you're not really wanting to do it. You're like, well, I'm not going right. to do a recipe. I'm just doing- Just throwing, prepping. just doing a little okay. chopping. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so I know we have to start to wrap up this conversation, but can you tell us a little bit about your one pot book. I know you have this cookbook for busy moms and families. And I know you have a lot of recipes that have that pack lots of nutrients and flavor. We're really excited to hear more about the cookbook, try out some of your recipes. Do you have a one or two favorites in there? Yeah. So um, my first cookbook, Meals That Heal, came out in 2019. And it was just over 100 quick and easy, everyday anti-inflammatory recipes. And then my, my second one, Meals That Heal One Pot, was designed to be even simpler in the, in the cooking process. So everything is one cooking vessel. So one sheet pan, one skillet, one stock pot, one, you know, one cooking vessel that you're messing up, that you've got your protein and your veggies and sometimes your, your carbohydrates. 
in all um, as one. So kind of tried to simplify to another level in my latest cookbook because I was needing it myself, you know, and if, you know, you don't want to cook dinner at night, then you certainly don't want to clean up. So, you know, the streamline. Yeah. <laughs> That's where the kids come in. <laughs> yeah. Oh. The streamlines um, that, but yes, I've got all of the recipes are ones that I eat that a lot of them are ones that I was already eating and just never written down in recipe form, you know, that were staples in, um, in, in our diet already. But, you know, I have quick lunches. I try to be cognizant of, you know, we are on the go these days. We need stuff made ahead, like for lunches or ready or easy to pack. And so I've got a ton of different salads, but hearty salads. There is a great um, rosemary chicken salad where you just quickly infuse some fresh rosemary in to some extra virgin olive oil and use that a little avocado oil mayonnaise to make the base. Um, and it, it's wonderful. I've got a Tex-Mex tuna salad in there. I've got a fabulous quinoa salad. And if people I've tried quinoa and don't love it. This is one to give, give it another try with this Mediterranean quinoa salad. It's really good. Um, and it may change your perspective on quinoa. Well, great. Well, thank you. And we want to mention that you're, we're going to do a, a special offer for our listeners and we're going to do a cookbook giveaway. So if you want to enter this cookbook, um, a couple of ways to do so, you can head over to Instagram right after this episode drops, we're going to run an Instagram giveaway, but you can also um, email us if you're you know, not on Instagram and get your name in the drawing for that cookbook. And then Carolyn will send it out to you. Yeah, I'm excited to share it with people. I was going to say, how else can people connect with you, Carolyn? Yeah, so I'm most active on Instagram. It's uh, my handle is at real food, real life underscore RD, but you can also search my name and I should pop up Carolyn Williams, PhD RD. Um, I also have a website, um, Carolyn Williams RD.com that people can go to. Um, and then I also host a podcast myself with a colleague called um, Happy Eating. And it explores the connection between diet and lifestyle and our mental wellness. And we have a lot of fun on that. Awesome. Thank you. I've listened to a couple of those episodes recently and they're just fun and just different topics. You know, not, it's not all just about food. So, so Carolyn, one last question we like to ask all of our uh, guests is what does the art of living well mean to you? Oh gosh. You know, what's so funny is It means, I'm in my 40s now, I'm 46. It means something completely different to me now than it did in my 20s and 30s. My 20s and 30s, I thought health and living well was all about diet and exercise. Yeah, I thought, no stress, you know. But but then after going through my daughter's um, own setting diagnosis of an autoimmune condition and having kind of a period of two years or so just extended nonstop stress. Um, I was really forced to see, okay, there's a lot more to living well and feeling good. And, you know, really my first priorities are just finding balance overall in my life, in my work, in my personal relationships, you know, in my health. But um, from a health perspective, you know, I really prioritize managing my stress and sleep. You know, if I don't get a good night's sleep, it's so hard to make, you know, to do, get my workout in, to make good food choices, to manage my stress. Um, And so I would say living well, it's got a much broader view for me now um, and incorporates a lot more things and finding, uh, you know, really just balance in all those things that I've. I uh, wasn't aware of and probably definitely didn't have back in my 20s and 30s. I um, I think a lot of us can relate to that for sure. <laughs> well, Absolutely. thank you so much for coming on our show today. This was really fun. And the, all the photos and the, the food just are so delicious and beautiful looking. So, you know, everyone's going to want to go out there and buy one of your cookbooks, especially the one pot one. I'm a big fan of just one vessel, especially during the week when you don't have a lot of time or helpers in your kitchen to help you clean up. So. 
I, I may be um I may be the four pot vessel girl because I feel like every time I call a cook, I have pots everywhere in the kitchen. So it would be nice to just use one. I can't really imagine that for myself, but it would be lovely. Yeah. 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 So thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Have a great day. You too. Bye.